we will yes thank you we're all very happy about that <laughs> um before we move in before we move into our um welcome and our prelude i just want to notice that we've got some opening sentences coming up and i wonder if anyone would like to uh read those sentences for us this morning and then you'll kind of know and when we come to that time you'll be ready to go so um invite one or two um people to be our readers for the opening sentences any any volunteers when we come to that point Ruth, yeah. Okay, I saw. I see yours too, Jack. But I think Karen beat you out just by a, a fingernail. So um, great. So when we come to the opening sentences in a few minutes, uh, Karen, I wonder if you would be the leader, and Ruth, I wonder if you would lead the people lines um, when we come to those. But for now, I invite you to take a deep breath wherever you are. Looking around the screen, I know that we're in a variety of places. Notice a place where you are sitting or standing or reclining and the land on which you rest. The land that holds you, the earth that bears you up, the gravity that keeps you in place. I invite you to be curious about who it is that has occupied and stewarded the land that you're on now before you on whose ancestral land you may find yourselves in Philadelphia. We are on the Lenape Hoking ancestral lands. I'm actually this morning in Northeastern Wisconsin on Potawatomi sacred land. May our worship and our words and our actions and our choices and our hearts and our spirits honor the lands that hold us, the people that have gone before us and those who will come after us. We're so glad that you're in worship this morning. And to begin, Kyoko will set the mood as she does and the tone and bring to us a prayer in uh, the form of musical notes. This morning is a piece by Franz Liszt, Un Suspiro, which means a sigh, played by Kyoko Makino. And following that, we'll have our opening sentences.
Amen. Oh, Kyoko, thank you for that. So I, I invite us in the spirit of that piece um, entitled Asai to take a deep breath and on the release just wherever you are, give a big sigh. Thank you, Kyoko. At this time, Kip is going to lead us in our opening song. morning. I'm Kip, the associate pastor, he, him, uh, and we'll sing through Gathered Here a couple of times. I know this is funny to sing on Zoom because we're gathered all over the place, and yet we're gathered here on Zoom as well. Gathered here in the mystery of this hour, Gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draw near. Gathered here in the mystery of this hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draw near. One more time. Gathered here in the mystery of this hour, Gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draw near. Amen. Amen. I just want to say before we do anything else, I want to say hi to Brayden because I see you right there and I just want to wave to you and it's so nice to see you. Maybe Kip will say hi to you again in a minute, but I just so wonderful to see your face. Our opening sentences are next and I invite Karen to lead us and Ruth to lead the people part um, and invite you to join in from wherever you are this morning. The dark earth cradles your knees, sun caressing your back. You yank weed roots, stake trellises, swat mats, muscles strain, hands building calluses. You cut roses so they won't fruit. Replace the spent annuals in the garden, dense with roots and vines. When a humble sprout climbs like a worm up out of death, you are there to bless it in your green patch. All spring and summer long, hose like a scepter, a reliquary vessel. Hum into the dreamy wildness, purified by your labors, connected to its innocence, co-creating with God. When you heft a woody, brushy tangle or stumble inside, grimy and spent by the earth. All the sacraments are in place and the redeemed world never smelled so sweet. Amen. Amen. And the redeemed world never smelled so sweet. Thanks, Karen and Ruth, for leading us. And thank you uh, for those opening sentences. Um, I invite us to turn our attention briefly to our announcements this morning. <clears throat> it's summer, but there's still things happening. We wanna really start out this morning by thanking our team that made this worship possible, Ian Ingebretson and on tech and Terry Roberts as our greeter this morning. I also want to um, give uh, some gratitude and appreciation to the folks who made worship in the backyard this morning possible, uh, to those volunteers and to the folks who were there this morning, um, led by Kip. So uh, we are grateful for all of that support. Pandemic parenting um, and honoring grief are both taking a break as is um, Rainbow Connection. So our community groups are taking a break for the month of uh, August. Um, and uh, look for more information when 
when September rolls around. Our next outdoor service will be Sunday, August 8th at nine o'clock in the morning. We'll be sending out a link for sign up for that day um, and you're welcome to join us. Thank you so much to everybody who filled out the survey for the nominating that, that, that the nominating team sent out. Um, we are uh, at um, the cusp of um, needing some significant new leaders. We have some positions that are open in the church that are very important. Uh, we invite you to consider those and many committees that um, need to be peopled and populated and impassioned. Um, if you have not seen that nominating survey or had a chance to fill it out, um, Kip's just put a link in the chat. We invite you to click on that. Uh, we'll also be sending it out again by email. Um, whether you are near or far in Philadelphia or further afield, this survey is for everyone um, because our leaders will be taking all shapes and sizes and coming from all geographic places. So we really invite you to consider prayerfully um, how you might be led to engage and participate in our life and mission and vision together. There will be a memorial service this Friday, um, not August, um, but this Friday, um, July 30th at four o'clock PM um, in Chestnut Hill, right uh, down the road from us um, at St. Martin in the Fields Episcopal Church. Um, the address is, um, is there on the screen and in the opening in your uh, order of service. Um, it's a memorial service for Cookie Green. Um, many of you know uh, Cookie and met her. Uh, many of you did not. Um, some of you knew Nellie, her daughter, who was our deacon for nearly three decades. Um, Cookie was uh, a kind of an indomitable, intrepid spirit um, who was uh, an active part of our church for, um, for many years. Um, and her service will be this Friday afternoon. Um, it will also be happening by Zoom. So uh, feel free to reach out to me and I'll connect you with the Zoom information, but it is in both in person and on Zoom. If you're still uh, have not collected some water from a special place, even if that's your uh, hose in the backyard or your kitchen sink or a beach or someplace where you have found or will find refreshment the rest of the summer, we invite you to gather some water and whether you're able to be with us in person or not in September, um, we'll be celebrating the gift of water and God's blessings on us and using that water um, in a variety of virtual and real ways um, uh, for our baptismal waters for this next year. Um, you'll be able to chat uh, directly with everybody or um, uh, directly individually one-to-one. -one. So the settings have been changed um, in, in our Zoom screen right now. Are there any other announcements that we need to make this morning? Okay, thanks so much. Over to you, Kip. This uh, is the time for our time with children. I see that we've got a couple of children. Juniper, I see you, and Braylon, I see you. I wonder if either of you would like to tell us anything this morning. Juniper. My little sister was born. Your little sister was born and is already in church with us. Can you tell us your sister's name? Zinnia. Zinnia. I am so excited that you get to be there with Zinnia sitting, sitting right there with you and that you are, you've got, oh, you've got your hand on her head. How, how does it make you feel to be a big sister, Juniper? Good. Good, yeah, and how do you think Zinnia feels right now, sitting there, lying there with you? I have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea, it's hard to know. <laughs> she looks very calm though. I'll bet she's feeling, she's feeling safe. She, I'll bet that she knows that she's with somebody who loves her. I can see on her face, she's looking right up at you. Like she knows you're someone safe and important to her. I am so glad that you get to share her with us this morning. Thank you so much. Welcome. Braylon, I saw Braylon too. Oh, Say hi. Say hello. Hi, hi. Braylon. Hello. hello. How are you this morning? Say good. Go. 
Say I went yeah. to a pool party yesterday. A pool party. And I didn't want to come out the water. <laughs> I'll bet. Braylon, you've got so many excellent words and I can't even see your mouth moving. <laughs> <laughs> Your mouth, your mouth. Yeah, I'm so glad that you're here too. Thanks, thanks for being with us and for letting us know about the pool. Say thank you. You say bye bye. Say okay. bye bye. You're waving. You say bye bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. All right. Well, that was that was really exciting. Um, so I'm so excited to to hear from both uh, Juniper and Braylon and to meet Zinnia for the first time. I'm going to offer now a first reading, which is uh, a poem by Karen Anway Lee, and that it's called "Songs of Comfort," and it's a it's a poem that uh, that reveals it's see it's got a little bit of a surprise that it reveals gradually, um, but it's a it's a it's a poem of a wonderful moment of generosity. Uh, and of finding gratitude in small moments. And this is, this is what it says. The friendly cellist with a big heart, a longtime resident of a neighboring town where I grew up, who received bouquets from the flower shop where I trimmed roses, said his favorite thing to do after returning from a trip was grocery shopping savoring the essentials of small life away from the airports and applause, buying milk, fruit, like blessings of solace, bread, tea, local honey in a jar, slow, lovely as sarabands, those songs without words aired in isolation through the pandemic. After his dose, Yo-Yo Ma plays an impromptu concert for others waiting in the 15 minute interval after the shots to monitor allergic reactions. Masked, he lifts his cello out of its case, perhaps his favorite one named Petunia, then tightens the horsehair bow adroitly. The cello with its mellow notes of melancholy mingled with hope fills the hall like the light at the end of the tunnel, the residents say, light at the end of the tunnel. I know it must be true because I would never put this trite sentence in a poem otherwise. God is waiting for us to pay attention. God is waiting in the light. Yo-Yo Ma offering a, an impromptu concert after being vaccinated. The uh, assigned Bible reading for this morning is a familiar story. Uh, I'm sure it will sound familiar once I get into it. It comes from John chapter 6. Uh, I'm not reading the entirety of what's assigned because the assigned lesson is two stories put together, and this one seems enough. So after this, it starts us in the middle of uh, what's going on, so we'll just know that it's after what just happened. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick people. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples, which is the teaching posture in the ancient world. Now, the Passover, the festival of the Jewish people was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, the disciple, where are we going to buy bread for all these people to eat? He said this to test him because he already knew what he was going to do. Philip answered, six months wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get just a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. There's a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 of them in all. Jesus took the loaves. When he'd given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. Same with the fish, as much as they wanted. 
When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them, and from the fragments of those five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And this is the word of God. Um, I wonder uh, what sort of reactions that story generates for anyone. And you can, if you want, you can take yourselves off mute to say. The reactions might be, oh, I've heard this at least once a year, every year of my life. Now, maybe it takes me back to my childhood. Maybe it awakens some deep lesson for me. I'm, I'm curious to hear what, what you respond to. In this, uh, in this reading. And if you want to say anything, you can just take yourself off mute. If, if you don't want to say anything, that's okay too. Maybe it's percolating, in which case. Uh, there will be a moment, you know, there will be, you'll be able to still speak. Uh, I, I, I want to maybe ask another question about memories of times when you knew that you belonged somewhere. Or can you call up a memory of being made to feel like, like you belonged or feeling like you were being taken care of I think we all got an excellent visual just a little minute ago about creating, uh, creating a situation where someone feels very cared for. Zinnia there looking up at uh, Juniper. Um, Becky in the chat, thank you. You wonder about miracles today. Oh, thank you. I, that is, um, that is, that's a lively question when we read these stories, isn't it? Because we're, um, Miracles in the ancient world may have, maybe they meant something different. Maybe they mean something similar to us. It's always a tricky proposition for us who are uh, talking to each other uh, over computers and the powerful computers we keep in our pockets everywhere. Um, yeah, but the, so the, the miracle stories, they, they raise some lively and interesting possibilities for us. Um, any, anything else? All right, well, I invite you to, if you can call not only into your mind, but recall in your body, the feeling of being held, being cared for, the feeling of belonging. Um, I think that those feelings are key to this story. That, e that whatever we think about miracles, whatever they might mean for us today, if we can be in touch with these feelings of wonder, of belonging, of risk-taking, of community, then this story is taking us into the world it wants to create. This story, the feeding of the 5,000, um, there, it is one, it is the only miracle story that shows up in all four of the gospels. Oh, the only one that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all hold in common. Every other miracle story of Jesus, um, at least one of the gospel writers left it out of their account. But there's something about this one that circulated generally in the storytelling around, about Jesus in those early Jesus movements that gave birth to the gospels, that, um, that this one was told through all four of the canonical gospels that we have. Um, but John has some details that are unique to his account. Some of them are because he's got a theological ax that he wants to grind, making sure that we, the readers, understand how important and exalted and elevated Jesus is. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 
Jesus has the, has the disciples distribute the food to the masses. But John puts that control in Jesus's hands himself. He suggests that uh, Jesus distributes the food to everyone who's seated, which I don't know if that means that anyone who wasn't seated didn't get some, or it just was an exceptionally long lunch because Jesus went to all 5,000 people individually. Um, but in all four of the gospels, this story echoes the story, the Hebrew story of the prophet Elisha who fed a crowd during a time of famine with only 20 loaves of bread. The story is that someone came to the prophet, again, during famine with 20 barley loaves, says, prophet, person of God, this is my offering for you. Please eat. And Elisha said, oh, I don't need this. Give it to the people. But uh, there's only 20 loaves here. This is not going to help the people. No, give it to the people. And all the people ate from just those 20 loaves. So clear echo here. But John is the only one of the four gospels who sets this story during the approach of the Passover feast. So Jesus is not in Jerusalem. He's outside of Jerusalem, goes up on a mountain, which is an important place to give a message. But during Passover, this is the time when pilgrims should have been flocking to Jerusalem for the festival. Instead, they're coming out to find Jesus in the mountains. So John's symbolism is pretty clear that uh, he's pointing towards the last guy who was connected with Passover and important messages from mountains, and that's Moses. So he's saying, look at, the, look at Jesus. You'll see Elisha, you'll see Moses, you'll see all this wrapped up in this guy. So that's John's theological axe to grind that he's putting into the story. But some of the details that he shares look more, they're more earthbound. They add a bit of realism, a bit of humanity. Uh, the other gospels just say that the disciples have the loaves and the fishes, or that somehow they were able to obtain them. Um, no real attention to how. Only John gives us the image of a young person offering up their lunch for other people to share. This is, this is my gift. I don't know what you can do with it, but this is what I will offer for everyone. And only John adds that they were barley loaves and dried fish, not nice freshly cooked fish, but dried fish. This was the food of peasants for all of the people in the story. Whatever their backgrounds, they were nourished by a shared and simple feast that drew them together instead of reinforcing their hierarchies. That's what John adds. There's also another funny detail that he adds that maybe sits in some tension with how hard he's working to make sure we know how high Jesus should be exalted. And it's that after everyone had their fill of the barley loaves and the dried fish, they got super excited and wanted to force Jesus to become their king. Now, it's true that the Bible uses some royal language and imagery. The Hebrew Bible certainly talks about God as a heavenly ruler. Um, and uh, some of the New Testament writings uh, exalt Jesus, use some kingly imagery for Jesus, uh, like the spiritual powers in all of creation bowing down to show their reverence. It makes sense. This was a world that knew empire and knew kingship very intimately. Their experiences with emperors and with kings were not all that great. Wealth trickled upward, if you can imagine that. Um, abuse was all too common. And this was even true of the good ones. Uh, oddly enough, another one of today's assigned Bible readings is the story of David and Bathsheba. David being the king that the Hebrew scriptures call a man after God's own heart. Um, and yet this story of David and Bathsheba, I will be delicate because of, uh, because of our, our mixed audience, our young audience here. But this is the story of a man in power using his power to, uh, to assault someone. And it results in a pregnancy. 
And this is followed not by him taking responsibility, but rather scheming to make sure that Bathsheba's husband would die in battle. And this was the model of the good king that, uh, that Israel knew. So it makes a certain kind of sense that the writers of the New Testament would position Jesus as a ruler who is over and above all of the other wretched and abusive rulers in the world. But here's the thing. In this story, when the people try to make Jesus their king, he flees from them. Now the, the translations often say something very calm, like withdrew from them and went to the mountains. But the term is fled. He literally hightailed it into the mountains to get away from the adoring crowd because he knew that they felt full. And they felt content. They felt the wonder and the glow and the beautiful sense of community that a shared meal can generate. They wanted that sense in their bodies of being held together and cared for. They wanted it to continue and they wanted him to be the one who would make it continue. But that wasn't his aim. He wasn't running a campaign for emperor. He wasn't the vending machine of miracles. The miracle stories of the Bible, oh, we'll say most of the miracle stories, because the second, the second one that's part of this story is Jesus walking on, on, on water um, to reach his disciples out on the sea. Um, but most of the healing stories, the feeding stories, the, the healing stories in particular, which is most of the miracle stories, they demonstrate spiritual power but they also offered ways of creating community and of restoring people to fullness in community. So maybe we noticed that even though John tells the story with all the focus on Jesus, Jesus goes into hiding in John's own story. And maybe we noticed that what made this whole story possible in the first place is that a young person offered what they had, offered their own gifts so that the whole community could be joined together and built up. And that is what Jesus used. So this is a story about risk, about generosity, about mutual care about creating a community of belonging. It didn't require a king. It required a response. Something I've been sitting with this week as, as I sat with this story is an essay from Carrie L. Day, who teaches theology and African-American religion at Princeton Theological Seminary. From 2016 to 2018, she was on a task force that, uh, that performed a historical audit to report on how the school benefited from the slavery economy. And then to start a conversation on what reparations would look like and how they could be implemented. In this essay that I was holding on to this week, she reflects on that process and on its aftermath. One of the things she talks about is a town hall event that was meant to let students address the task force and the seminary trustees about the audit and the demand for reparations. Um, as often happens, with these sorts of conversations, it got a little tense, uh, in part because the representatives of institutions weigh their words carefully because they know they're not just speaking for themselves, but for the institution, and that can make them seem insincere. But one of the moments that Day describes is of a young white woman who seemed to be having a deep awakening about the way that history's racism remains embedded in the present. So she stood at the microphone. She named that the academic funding she receives as a Presbyterian student of a Presbyterian seminary was very generous. And she 
she talked to the administration, she addressed the, the administration and said that she would be willing for some of her funding to be redistributed to black students because they bear student loan debt burdens disproportionately. Day writes about this, being clear that she's not um, trying to turn this student into the hero of her story. And she notices uh, and describes how several Black students spoke with her afterward to say how shocked they were by this. One in particular, she said, talked with her about how he generally had trouble trusting white students. And that makes all kinds of sense because saying the right thing is a lot easier than doing the right thing. And doing the right thing costs more, which uh, often the right words stop before the costs begin. There are plenty of examples of white people saying the right things, but not following up. This student's comments and her conviction moved something in him, and he decided to offer something as well, which was the vulnerability to trust. So he sought her out after the town hall meeting, started a conversation with her, um, a big risk on his behalf, gifts exchanged, community created, loaves and fishes. That I think is the story, the story's question. What do you have to offer? What do you need to receive? This isn't a story of something being created out of nothing. It's, a, it's not a story about Jesus being forced into the role of the all providing king. It's a story of gifts offered and community created of bread and dried fish that made for a feast, of giving and receiving, of conviction, vulnerability, and trust. It's not a one and done miracle. It's an invitation. This is God's good news. Amen. Amen, thank you, Kip. So we don't have bread or dried fish this morning, but our version of feasting with one another and offering our gifts and creating community is when we share our prayers with one another, when we risk vulnerability to open our heart and share what is happening in this circle and the gift of offering um, our witness uh, to those prayers and also a commitment to hold them in our own hearts and continue to hold them in our spirits when we go from this place. It's the way that we um, can share and nurture one another. So this is the time when we um, uh, offer our prayers. We will begin, um, Kip will lead us in our sung prayer response first, and then we will open um, the room for prayers. You can, when the time comes, um, uh, send them to Kip in a chat, or you can raise your digital or or a uh, real hand and we'll call on you to offer your prayers. So Kip will first lead us in a sung prayer response. Um, we just take a, a brief moment to notice um, the ways that we give ourselves to the world, the ways that we give ourselves to one another, the ways we give ourselves to this church community through our prayers and our presence and our gifts and our service and our commitment to growth. Um, we invite you to continue to discern what that offering looks like and means for you. And we'll put a link in the chat if that is um, a helpful thing for you this morning. And as we do that, we will prepare for our closing song this morning. Kip will lead us in that. And again, the table can be our place around our Zoom connections. Uh, sing about sitting at the welcome table. You're welcome to clap if you like, or dance, or make noise in whatever way you want. 
We're going to sit at the welcome table. We're going to sit at the welcome table one of these days. Hallelujah. We're going to sit at the welcome table. Going to sit at the welcome table one of these days. All kinds of people around that table. All kinds of people around that table one of these days, hallelujah. All kinds of people around that table gonna sit at the welcome table one of these days. No fancy style at the welcome table. No fancy style at the welcome table one of these days, hallelujah. No fancy style at the welcome table. Gonna sit at the welcome table one of these days. Amen. Go from this place, this community we have formed together this morning, this community that holds us and includes so many more, so many others in other places this morning, this community that includes those who have gone before us and those who will come after us. Go from this place knowing that you belong. You belong to us. You belong to God. You belong to love. Know that even if you think you know what love is, there is such a deeper, greater love holding you, beckoning you, calling you, bearing you through now and whatever is to come, a love that persists across time and space that joins us and connects us to a bigger universe, all held in the love of God. Go from this place in peace. Amen. <laughs>